The ancients were aware of certain herbs by means of which a trance could be caused or a suspension of the ordinary animation of the sensory perception. They made use of such herbs for sacred reasons. And there is considerable evidence that the use of wine in the early sacraments of both the pagans and the Christians was the result of the peculiar ecstasy which was produced by this stimulation. Thus, men have cherished in one way or another a concept that by some means, natural or artificial, the ordinary functions of the mind could be suspended, and that during these periods of suspension, man might receive a meaningful inner experience and that this experience could have a beneficial effect upon his outer life, and for that matter, in the case of famous mystics, upon the lives of many other persons. Now our concern this evening is primarily to study something of the machinery implied in this type of thinking. Unfortunately, there is a sufficient amount of general evidence so that we can proceed safely at least a moderate distance into our inquiry. Man, according to Plato, possessed two natures, one an essential nature derived from God, and the other a material nature derived from the earth or from the physical elements of being. These two natures, combined within the human constitution, resulted in an entity which we call the soul. To the Greeks, the soul was a twofold creature. It was never regarded merely as one entity. They held it to be two contrary or striving natures, one continually striving to ascend into the presence of the ineffable, and the other continually striving to maintain the authority of matter over the life and consciousness of the individual. One part of the soul was considered to be objective and physically animate. This part, uh, including the sensory perception, the emotions, and the lower mental nature, naturally verged toward the obvious and was more concerned with the perpetuation of its material state than in any further or abstract exercise. This part of the soul was sometimes referred to as the mortal soul or the animal soul. And it was usually regarded as being dominant in the uninitiated, unenlightened human being. Those who had not, by some striving within themselves, by some purification, or some cathartic discipline imposed upon their natures, had not risen in consciousness to the realization of the reality of the divine soul in themselves. Such persons were referred to as, by Plotinus, as beasts in the world of men. Now, this was not quite as insulting as it might first sound. It simply meant that these creatures lived an essentially animal existence, that animation to them was principally function, and that this function was concerned primarily with the survival of the corporeal state, with the advancement of corporeal concerns and considerations, the accumulation of worldly goods, the search for fame, honor, and distinction, and the highly competitive struggle for existence which now is regarded as the normal way of life. The Greeks were convinced that this so-called normalcy was really only an indication that most persons had not sought within themselves for a better way of life. 
The so-called normalcy was a product of comparative inertia. But the individual, not resisting any of the common pressures of life, but surrendering himself at all times to the most mortal of his interests and activities, simply lived in an objective state. He lived, whether asleep or awake, primarily in this world, of this world, under the hypnosis of the, pro of the procedures and processes peculiar to this state of nature. This led Plato to regard nature itself with certain suspicion. He held that nature, in some way, sought to fasten itself upon the human soul, to keep man in bondage to the innumerable patterns and forms which surround him and which are made known to him through his sensory perception. But substantially, Buddha held the same position. He regarded the material state of man as a prison, as a place of limitation, or perhaps at best, a place of instruction. Man was here not merely to gratify or to fulfill the instincts of his mortal psychic part. He was here primarily to outgrow the limitation upon his own consciousness. He was here to increase in inward grace and perfection of spirit, and to elevate the mind above the concerns of this world uh, to the concerns of the divine world, or of the universal nature to which he actually belonged, and of which he was actually a fragment or part. Under these conditions, it would be apparent that the objectification of the human faculty in the process of waking would have a tendency to hypnotize the person and bind him more and more to the concept of the reality of matter. As all of his interests centered here, as all of his activities were expressed here, it became only a uh, probable or reasonable that he should regard this world as the true abode of himself, that he should think of other worlds as distant or remote, and he should think of the invisible as unreal. He should think of things not easily understood as mystery. He should regard that which was abstract as unfathomable. It was much easier for him to surround himself with mystery and remain more or less oriented in a mortal life than to hurl himself into the sea of mystery, than to come in contact with forces and circumstances about which he had little or no knowledge. Also in the course of time, as the philosophers have pointed out, man has increased in mortal knowledge. He has gone further and further in his investigation of this material world. Yet his investigations have not been sufficiently rich in internal value to guarantee the maturity of his consciousness. He thus remains comparatively unconscious in a world of consciousness. He remains posited almost solely in a material state, in a world in which the material state is the lesser part. He has become so convinced but this lesser part is the all, the total, the completeness of faith. That he regards anything beyond this lesser part as highly theoretical, speculative, and uncertain. The only solution to this problem, of course, lies in the reorientation of man himself. His only hope of escaping from this peculiar illusion into which he has fallen is that he shall develop such faculties and powers as will enable him to recognize the reality of things now held to be distant and mysterious. If man actually can orient himself onto a higher level of function, it is natural that this function, this higher level, will then become real, and that which he has left behind will slowly fade away as unreality. Reality is always the focal point of awareness. Reality is always where we are now, what we are now, and those things now perceived or considered. Thus it is essential to our growth 
uh, that we experience a new kind of now on a higher level of function and understanding. Yet Plato also pointed out, as did the Egyptians and many other ancient peoples, that the so-called divine soul, or the higher part of man's psychic life, though not generally much uh, considered or involved in his mortal action, nevertheless had an existence, had a continuing reality in itself, and was not destroyed or dissipated by the failure of the objective nature to understand or comprehend its meaning. The soul, in its higher sense, was as all superior things must be, greater, wiser, and better than those faculties and functions which are beneath it and which are dependent upon it for their energy and their life. Thus the immortal soul is nobler than the mortal soul, and that part of man's consciousness which contemplates the eternal is superior to that part which can contemplate only temporal things. It is also essential to man that in some mysterious way this inner spiritual soul should have a means of communication with the objective life. This means of communication would naturally be incomplete or imperfect while it was not cultivated or disciplined. Yet it remained present, an available help in time of trouble. That part of man's consciousness which comes into function when all other functions fail, or when the problems confronting the individual are not to be solved by any of his ordinary faculties. One of the most simple examples of man's effort to reach into himself, into this higher psychic nature, this higher psychic reality, is the problem of prayer. Prayer becomes, in most cases, where it is genuine, a statement of necessity. It is sincerely spoken or a thought only when man is in his extremity. It is something that we turn to when other things have failed. It is our hope of justice, where otherwise justice is not reasonably to be expected. It is our hope of health, when all physical healing has been ineffective. It is our hope of understanding when we find the wisdom of this world insufficient to our needs. And thus man turns for spiritual consolation to some mysterious root within himself, making use of faculties and powers which are only occasionally called upon in his so-called everyday existence. The very circumstance of prayer bears witness to a law operating in life. The prayerful mood is really always one of humility. It is also one of spiritual expectancy. The individual really hopes and believes that his prayer will be given consideration. In order to be truly prayerful, Jesus told his disciples that they should enter into a closet and pray to their Father in secret, and that the Father who heard them in secret would reward them openly. This idea of entering into the closet or the quiet place seemed definitely to imply that man must have a worshipful attitude, a worshipful mood, if he is to expect to receive any guidance from the invisible sources of life. This relaxed this quietude, this sense of reverence with which man enters into communion with the divine, these qualities are all of them calculated to reduce the, the tensions which are indicative of the so-called animal or mortal soul. Thus the individual achieves communion with the interior part of himself by attaining quietude, by re reducing the pressures of his desires, by reducing the determinations of his will. For prayer is the process of permitting the divine to have its way in man. It means that man must relax away from his own purposes 
and from those values which under normal circumstances are dominant in his life. He must be prepared to sacrifice that which is perhaps most difficult for him to renounce, and that is self-will, self-determinism, and to place himself utterly in the keeping of universal principles. Naturally, a prayer of this kind, often accompanied by a ritual appropriate to it, or by periods of purification and fasting, or by various uh, other rites and ceremonies, these processes have a tendency to bring about a condition of semi-sleep, if we understand the full implication of the term to sleep. Sleeping is actually the ceasing of our objective awareness. If we voluntarily sacrifice self-purpose, we achieve a kind of unpurposed state, which is similar to sleep. If we voluntarily sacrifice the testimony of our sensory perception, to trust rather upon the power of internal guidance, we also remove energy from these perceptions, reducing them, quieting them, calming them, and causing them to lose dominion over our conduct. Thus, while it is true that in sleep we achieve this relaxation, it is also true that in meditation or contemplation or in the higher disciplines of yoga or Vedanta, we also have this kind of detachment, this separation from things which have been pressing and urgent, this slipping away from the authority of the material world to govern our every reflex and instinct. Thus we may achieve a kind of waking state, a quietude, in which the consciousness gains also certain means of communication. I think perhaps the Taoists have as good a simile for this as almost any other religious group. Man must create a kind of capacity. He must transform his lower nature into a receiving vessel into which the waters of life can be poured. And in order that this vessel may receive these waters, it must be emptied of its previous content, whatever this content may have been. We cannot pour more water into a full vessel. We cannot bring more enlightenment to a self-opinionated person. We cannot take the worldly wise man who is certain of his own ideas and impose upon those ideas the will of heaven. Man must first of all empty himself of false knowledge. He must relax himself away from those opinions and attitudes and beliefs and convictions which have long held him prisoner, and which many of them are responsible for the emergency in which he finds himself. Thus he attains a kind of emptiness. He, retain, he attains what Bernie calls the great thirst the desire for that which is real, the tremendous instinct to partake of the food of life rather than of the food of death. Thus, in quietude, we do have the individual entering into a voluntary state of peace, a state which is perhaps very similar to that of sleep. In sleep, the loss of consciousness is complete. In the, in the state of peace, the loss of self-consciousness is complete. The individual does not cease to be aware, but he ceases to be obsessed or possessed by the products of his own awareness processes. This having been attained, the person finds himself receptive to the benediction of the internal. Plato tells us that under such conditions, the inner life of man may come through into his outer awareness, may impose itself symbolically or in some way upon his outward nature, delivering through man himself those oracles, messages, and important uh, revelations which are necessary 
to the essential growth of man. Special Pythagoras and many others affirm very clearly that the highest instruction that man can receive must come from within himself. That this instruction arises in his own consciousness as the gift of the divine within his own nature. Therefore, that man is most instructed when self-instructed, that is, receiving instruction from his own over-self, as Emerson might have called it. All the uh, point we wish to particularly make is that there is this condition of imposed silence, of carefully calculated relaxation by which many wonderful mysteries can be attained in consciousness. The Greeks, the Egyptians, and the Hindus also carried the matter beyond this point. For they not only achieved relaxation, but they imposed certain specific disciplines or exercises. And these exercises, in many of the instances recorded, have transcended the mere quieting of the personal consciousness and as in the Buddhist discipline, achieved a complete suspension of objectivity. In this suspension of objectivity, the meditating person lost not only his external awareness of places and objects, but his own external awareness of self-existence. He became suspended in a state in which his own awareness uh, was not much more apparent than in the case of sleep. He managed to become a being meditating without the realization or acceptance of selfhood. He was merely life in life. He was consciousness in consciousness. His own pleasures and purposes and desires had ceased even to be of interest to him. He remained in a kind of suspension, a suspension in which he felt or experienced or knew the immediacy and imminence of the eternal. And as in the case of the great later Indian saint, Sri Ramakrishna, he passed from his meditational condition into a kind of ecstasy, into a trance-like or coma-like state, not produced now by the ordinary processes of sleep or by the extraordinary processes of drugs, but rather by the actual use of his own internal faculties faculties which he had so trained that they were able to sustain their, own, uh, sustain their own continuity of internal consciousness. And that this internal consciousness was not in any way related to self-consciousness as we know it. This in turn has become the great problem of many scholars in relationship to Buddha's concept of the nirvana, which to the Westerner means extinction but which more directly to the Easterner means suspension. It means only the extinction of that which is not so. It means only man's recognition of the unreality of the material or illusionary state of being. Now all this has a bearing upon our principal theme inasmuch as it indicates some of the processes which ancient mystics have used uh, to invoke uh, transcendent experiences. Another very common uh, type of uh, process was that of fasting or extreme asceticism. Fasting is a process of reducing the power of the body over the soul. Now we have many attitudes on this and most modern persons regard such uh, ancient disciplines as fasting for religious purposes as archaic, or belonging to another time, or laden with superstition or extraordinary fanaticism. But the principle behind fasting has been known since the dawn of time and has been practiced by nearly all primitive people long before they had any theology or philosophy such as we know. The experience of fasting with them led to one inevitable conclusion. Namely, that as the power of the body or the bodily energy was depleted, uh, the individual became more sensitive uh, to superphysical experiences. The person fasting 
that cleanse the body of its principal toxins. And toxins, of course, are one of the causes of psychic tension and irritation. The person, therefore, who had reduced the body awareness with which we are so uh, much concerned, also had reduced the body complaint, which is constantly and insidiously encroaching upon our consciousness, and reduced the bodily incentive, the vitalities by means of which we are impelled to various successes of action. The reduction of all these left the person perhaps weak, perhaps in this weakness also drowsy uncertain of his own objectivity. It was easier for him to sleep in this space, and he found that his sleeping had a certain clarity which was not common where the body was laden with a, a mass of physical impurity. Thus purification and fasting, because of their effect upon the endocrine system or the ductless gland chain of the human body, seem to lead more directly and immediately to a condition of complete receptivity to the overself. Thus ancient uh, primitive people went out into the wilderness, and there they fasted and prayed, meditated and waited. And in this kind of quiet, watchful waiting, they achieved a rapport with life that is almost entirely unknown to us. We watch for very little that is not within the gamut of our sensory perception. We wait for almost nothing. Our lives are dedicated to expediency, to immediate action, whether they are well considered or not. As a result of this haste, of this continual externalizing of our every resource, we do not have either the time nor the inclination to become especially subjective or to search within ourselves for hidden and subtle forces that will not appear or manifest their own nature while man obscures them with the pressure of his physical interest and activity. So we know also that under certain stress or strain of a psychological nature, man may be disturbed by dreams. The dreams, therefore, constitute a kind of symbolism. We know that by means of the dream process, certain essential psychological verities may be revealed. That in his dream symbolism, the individual may receive a clearer insight into his own composition. He may become more acutely aware of the causes of his own psychoneurotic tension. In dreams, therefore, he receives the direct impact of pressures or forces or disturbances which come to him in his conscious state, physically conscious state, only as obscure impulses or difficult uh, instincts with which he has to struggle throughout the day. Thus in sleep we do know that a certain therapy is in applied, that it is quite possible that in sleep things to confused or obscured become clarified. We also know that in sleep the subconscious or subjective part of man is more available to influence than in his waking state. We also know that in the hypnotic state, which is that of an artificially induced state, the individual is able to be influenced far beyond that which is possible under his normal objective uh, conditions. Thus the door that leads into the world of sleep leads into many mysteries, leads into strange byways and paths about which we know comparatively little and which under normal conditions may cause us fear or anxiety. Back to our original consideration, visions are unquestionably types of psychical experiences derived principally from within ourselves. Now, there may be instances in which this is not essentially true, but a vision, for the most part, is a valid kind of dream. It is a dream of meaning. It is a dream of purpose, a dream of communication between the inner and the outer life of the individual. 
It is a dream usually in which some larger value, perhaps of a highly spiritual nature, of a reality beyond our uh, easy estimation, is suddenly projected upon us by means available, when by re reason or argument no such impression could be made. The dream has peculiar validity as vision or as mystical experience because it is so totally our own. A, a dream can give us a sense of inevitable. It makes something which would otherwise be impossible or incredible, both acceptable and uh, useful. If, for example, uh, we can imagine what may well have occurred in the debate between Paul of Tarsus and the early Christian community. We know that Saul or Paul was a sincere man, that he was convinced that the Christian heresy had to be stamped out. Also, however, Paul was a thoughtful person, a regular and devout member of his own congregation. He believed sincerely in the importance of religion in the life of man. He did not, however, agree with or believe the religion of the Christian. There is no doubt that he was subjected to some pressure in this direction. It was quite possible that efforts had been made to convert him, but he resisted stoutly on the ground of his own basic religious principles. It would have been comparatively impossible to have argued Paul into a state of Christian acceptance. It is doubtful if any scholar could have achieved it. It is doubtful if any amount of reading or study would have converted him. For the reason that he felt that his own spiritual interior was right, that what he was doing had the sanction of his God, that he was correct in his own interpretation of this matter. And from his later conduct, we realize that his correctness was not simply a matter of ego. It was not that he felt that he believed that he knew more than other people. He was simply a devout member of his faith, and he believed his faith. He held it to be sacred. But somewhere in his early contact with Christianity, something must have moved Paul profoundly. That which consciously he could not accept, or did not accept, must have awakened some form of subconscious realization in his own nature. Therefore, Paul truly, perhaps, had that double soul reaction. The higher soul, which probably verged toward Christianity, and the lower or human rational soul, which perhaps is what he meant when he referred to the thorn in his flesh. On the road to Damascus, the theophany, or the mystical experience of Paul, becomes, therefore, a tremendous internal release. It was the power of something locked in him over the power of his own believing. His inner life had in some way been touched, moved, or affected by the message of the Galilean. And his resistance to this inner impulse was a resistance of patriotism, a resistance born out of religious duty, the same that many of us feel when we do not wish to be led out of the face of our childhood into some religion or belief that is strange and unknown to us. We feel a certain sense of loyalty to the God we have worshipped in the past, and it is not easy always to change that loyalty or to permit it to grow or to enlarge its own values. We believe that our orthodoxy is our virtue. Therefore, we try to cling to that virtue. In the case of Paul, the inner life certainly burst through. It is described in the older apocryphal writings, at least, that he was riding upon a horse on the way to Damascus uh, to persecute the Christian community there. He had already attacked one of the disciples and injured him in physical combat. And Paul was very close to a situation in which a great war of values 
and was being fought within his own psychic nature. Then came what is described as this flash of light, this tremendous burst of radiance. Paul fell stunned from his horse to the ground and lay there temporarily blinded. In the midst of this uh, tremendous psychic stress, which some have even gone so far as to say represented a convulsion or some kind of an apoplectic stroke. But in any event, whatever it was, in the midst of this, Paul had the experience of the theophany. In one account, it is implied that he actually saw Jesus or appeared to see him and that Jesus spoke to him. In another account in the same uh, Bible, uh, Paul apparently did not claim to have seen anyone but a great light and a voice speaking out of the light. And this voice undoubtedly spoke the very words that Paul's own soul was crying out to utter. Paul was not by nature a persecuting man. It must have been a very difficult thing for him to have felt that his religion required that he persecute someone else. Once his clear concept uh, was attained, he not only never persecuted again, but also permitted himself to be persecuted to martyrdom. Therefore, he was not by nature an evil man who wanted to hurt people. And it is quite possible that the final revulsion came as a result of his own older religion seeming to demand violence of him, a violence against the faith of other good people, something which Paul rebelled against inside, even though he could not put his rebellion into the terms of his conscious mind. In any event, this experience was a breaking through, undoubtedly, of something locked within Paul. It was a breaking through under an extraordinary pressure. Now, there are several possible explanations for the pressure itself. Some have suggested that in light of the region and the condition, a sunstroke or heat prostration might well have been a contributing cause. It might also well be that as he was on his way to the final act of persecution, that the conflict within himself became unendurable. Here there came a tremendous psychic revulsion. And this revulsion took the form of the simple question that he probably asked himself. Why did he persecute these people? And this problem as to why he should persecute came through in all its force. And from that time on, Paul persecuted no more. He was still blind, as he said, when he reached the master. And his sight was restored to him by one of the elders of the Christian community there. Here we should have a very interesting and almost complete problem for modern psychoanalysis. A problem which would not reflect adversely upon the character of Paul. Would not make him appear to be an evil man, suddenly transmuted into a good man by a mere act of providence. This act of providence was Paul himself. And this is indicated by his ministry from that point on. This ministry could not have arisen in a man of lacking great courage of character, great dedication to principle, and a profound respect for truth in all of its aspects. But in this theophany, we have the struggle of a highly enlightened, highly sensitive person and the sudden revulsion within himself accompanied by violent symptoms. Thus we see that a vision can be, and probably often is, the statement of a reality inwardly held, but not externally accepted. Man may well be better inside than he is on the outside. He may well know more, because as we go into the interior parts of man, we also enter into the superior aspects of his consciousness. Whatever is the best of man is locked at the core of his being. And as man reaches further and further in toward that core, he becomes aware of greater and greater value and is therefore 
more impelled to the conduct of his nature in a commendable way. We do not know whether Paul was able to rationalize these problems, although it is implied that he was a student of Platonic philosophy. But in any event, it would be quite reasonable to assume that a struggle had occurred between the mortal soul with its material dedication to form and tradition and the immortal soul, the divine part, that recognized no dedication except to that of the highest principle that could be known and estimated by that being. Now, it is quite true that many such visions have been reported, and that these visions lie at the basis of the canonization of a great many of the early saints of the church. Visions of this kind are still reported, not only in Christianity, but among nearly all people, perhaps uh, very strongly among the Muslims and Buddhists. These visions, nearly always, are visions implying or suggesting a nobler condition a state beyond that which is ordinarily acceptable. And they bestow the strength for a voluntary allegiance to a greater and better cause, or to a fuller expression of some great spiritual reality. Under such conditions, we are also aware that the vision may occur in a condition or time not normally associated with sleep. But as in the case of St. Paul, we find that the actual occurrence was preceded by a shock or some mysterious force that cast uh, the future apostle into a state of confusion and comparative unconsciousness. In other words, whatever the original element of the uh, pattern was, the theophany was preceded by something that blinded him, a light that burst upon his consciousness and hurled him to the ground a kind of power that paralyzed him completely and made it impossible for him to maintain any objective uh, mental integration. He was simply thrown into a complete internal confusion. And in, this, in the midst of this suspension of all his worldliness, uh, the core or significant part of the vision transmission took place. He then gradually gathered his faculties about him and proceeded on to Damascus. But in a crippled and uh, miserable state, greatly fearful, uncertain, and in the mood of despising himself. It was only after the, the full impact of the circumstance began to be recognized and realized that it led to the dedication uh, which gave the world the extraordinary ministry and service of the Apostle Paul. Now, we do not necessarily assume that everyone has so vital or startling an example of this peculiar psychic process, but we do know that nearly everyone has an availability, a means of reaching into self, if this means is called upon, or if an emergency or urgency should demand or require it. There are innumerable cases of visions of varying degrees which have led to a powerful changes in the life of the person and also powerful ministry uh, to others in various religious, philosophical, uh, and even scientific things. The vision is not unknown to science. It is not unknown to scientists although because of the peculiar intellectual orientation which they have, it is not as common with them as it is with persons of a more simple and devout mentality. Simplicity is another point in which nature seems to be profoundly concerned. And uh, most of your mystics, particularly those of Asia and the earlier Christian mystics, actually cultivated a kind of simplicity of nature and life and of thought. They were seldom to be considered as sophisticated persons. Many of them were not scholars as we understand scholarship. They were more considered as pious people, living simply in an almost continuous state of prayer or of strong, continuing faith, and therefore almost constantly, psychically relaxed. Under such conditions, 
uh, the availability of the mystical experience is greater than with most uh, ordinary uh, folk. Plotinus, the great Neoplatonist, describes in substance two or three visions which occurred to him during his lifetime. Plotinus was a philosopher. He was an intellectual. He was a man of powerful mind and most penetrating genius. He was one of the outstanding leaders of the world of thought of his time. Yet Plotinus was not an intellectual as we would judge them today. He was not a sophisticated. He was not a worldly man. He was not a seeker after knowledge for the sake of knowledge. He was primarily a mystic. And uh, Neoplatonism, which derives so much from him, uh, is considered today as a mystical rather than an essentially philosophical doctrine. Plotinus describes mystical experiences which occurred, which lasted only a brief time, and which were very rare of happening, but which profoundly affected his life in those moments in which it seemed that he was lifted up and brought into identity with reality. He had then a peculiar sense of belongingness. He was one with space. He was one with life and eternity and time. He found his true relationship to existence, a relationship of identity, a relationship of profound sympathy, a relationship which brought both tears and laughter to his soul, a relationship in which the universality of the good became not realized or believed but perfectly and fully known by a total conscious experience of fact. These experiences of Plotinus uh, certainly must be included among the great historical mystical occurrences. We know also that Plotinus and his school cultivated metaphysical discipline, that they practiced concentration and meditation much in the spirit of the Pythagoreans, that they set aside parts of the day and of life for the quiet contemplation of the will of God. And while they approached the mysteries of the universe intellectually, they tried to think with the mind of God. They tried to understand with the understanding of God. Thus, they were pious, devout persons, even though they were brilliant scholars. This combination is not so common in these days, where scholarship and piety are further apart than ever before in history. Yet, uh, it is the bringing together of these two that seems to make possible more direct internal leadership, more participation in the mysteries of heaven. We know, of course, that most of the book of John known as the Apocalypse, or the revelation of John on the island of Patmos, that this entire book is written as a dream, or as a mystical experience. John did not know whether he was in the flesh or not. He was simply separated from worldliness. And in this separation, the story, the vision of the apocalypse was unfolded to him. Here again is a mystical revelation arising from previous personal experiences, from previous knowledge and indoctrination, from the religious community in which he dwelt. For while on the island of Patmos, he was close to some of the greatest centers of ancient pre-Christian mysticism, we have here many factors, perhaps revealing much of the background of John that would not be recorded by the gospel historians, the story of the inner life of the man, which finally blazed out in the vision of the apocalypse. Thus these visions do have some valid core relating to our own peculiar problems and our own peculiar needs. Yet they do not end there. They end with a kind of clarification. The problem becomes ensouled by a power greater than itself, and by this very process ceases to be a problem. A problem exists only when man, man is less than the problem. When he becomes greater than the problem, the problem is, is absorbed into his own greatness. And there is a tremendous spiritual exhilaration arising from this victory 
of the self over circumstance, or of the good man over providence. All these things then can be brought right back to our own daily lives and the situations in which we find ourselves. I think although we are not aware of it under normal conditions, that we participate more in mystical experiences than we know. The mystical experience in a large and complete pattern is probably a stranger to most, but in a series of continuing interior impulses, I suspect that it is not entirely strange to the average person. We all have moments, moments in which it appears that our knowledge or our understanding transcends itself. There are instances when our judgment is greater than we realize. There are seconds in which decisions are made that are better than we know. There are tremendous emergencies which we meet with a new courage or a profound sense of value which a few hours before would not have been available to us. Thus it would appear that the individual is subject to an insight due to a kind of disorientation. This type of disorientation arises when the individual suddenly finds himself inadequate. When we are suddenly aware that we have lost control of a situation, or lost control of ourselves, or that we face an unknown that is deeper than we can fathom, there is this moment of uncertainty. There is this moment of confusion. And in this instant, our self-assurance breaks down. In this instant, this instant our self-sufficiency breaks down. And of course, most of all, we may be confronted by a sudden evidence that our own thinking has been poor. That instead of being always right, as we thought we were, we are suddenly confronted by the proof that we are wrong. That something, something that was supposed to happen did not. Something we trusted would not happen occurred. And we are out of focus uh, with our own previous concept. We have uh, become involved in a mystery. A mystery in which our ordinary faculties are not adequate. In this moment of hesitation, in this moment of disorientation, there seems to be a temporary weakening of the objective faculties. We are a little discouraged at them. We are, we are suddenly unsold upon them. We are no longer certain that they are what we have thought them to be. For a second, therefore, they lose their authority to dominate us. And in that moment in which the objective mind no longer has authority, the subjective mind comes through, taking over this situation and bestowing the remedy, or giving us some insight or clue as to that which can usefully solve our problem. It is also noted that while man dreams undoubtedly throughout most of the periods of sleep, Significant dreams have the tendency to center in the early morning hours. In these hours, the individual is perhaps in a situation or condition more resembling trance than true sleep. In true sleep, we have an almost complete unconsciousness. The person rests in, a, in an oblivion of mind, and uh, under normal conditions, and has slight if any recollection in waking of anything that occurred during his sleeping hours. However, in the early morning hours, where visions are most frequent, especially those of an authoritative nature, man appears to be less asleep. He is almost in a light hypnosis from which he could rather easily awaken. In fact, at the proper time in the morning, he usually awakens himself by habit in order to meet the, the requirements of the day. He sets his mind at 7 o'clock, he will awake at 7 o'clock. But by that time, the mind has begun again to exercise authority. Yet somewhere in the mysterious middle distance between true sleep and waking, there is a period in which the two zones of consciousness seem very close together. 
The Egyptians were aware of this. Most ancient people have noted this phenomenon. And they have declared that it was in these small hours of the morning that the two worlds, the visible and the invisible, were the closest together. And that, for that reason, births are most numerous at this time, and so are deaths. For in these hours, situations uh, come to such a fine edge that the two states of existence seem to mingle and move together and flow into one, and then gradually, as the hours proceed, separate again, with man returning to an objective or exterior consciousness. Visions of importance presented to us by the psychic nature are very little value unless we are able to record them. Therefore, what we actually need is a kind of sleeping in which memory and certain other faculties are still somewhat alert. If we have a total obliteration of faculties, we will have no adequate recollection of the dream. Other conditions, of course, other than the hour itself, may influence this. The individual may find uh, that at a certain time, under pressure, worry, fear, or other uh, burdens, that he does not sleep well. And this uh, uh, suspension, this condition of half sleep and half waking, may occur at other hours due to the disturbances of his life. The one apparent fact remains namely that the valid vision demands a certain degree of both subjective and objective awareness. It demands that the subjective be active and positive, and that the objective be partly active but receptive. Thus we may have the psychic experience flow from the invisible roots of the mind uh, to be finally recorded on, in the subtle substances of the brain itself. Unless this record is made, the project is imperfect. The record itself can have a number of meanings and will very often be presented as most dream phenomena in a series of symbols. Uh, some of the um, uh, masters of psychology today like to think of certain dreams as archetypal that they are accompanied by a different state of the consciousness from ordinary dreaming, which may originate from any form of one form or another of the psychic pressure of the lower mind itself. Dreams can arise, therefore, from the pressure of the lower psyche, which because of its various afflictions or distortions or disfigurements through tension, stress, and neurotic situations, uh, becomes the source of symbolic dream by which its abnormalcy is revealed. Thus, uh, by means of a certain kind of dream, the lower psyche tells us that it is sick. These dreams are of a diagnostic nature. They can be analyzed and studied, and from them, the condition of the mental-emotional complex can be determined with some accuracy. The type of dream to which we are referring, however, primarily, the archetypal dream, is of a different kind. It is a directive dream. It is the kind of a vision or experience that is not to be regarded as an hallucination or merely a fantasy of sleep. It is meaningful and purposeful. It is not completely diagnostic. It does not necessarily tell us what is the matter with us, although it may reveal in its own message certain things that are wrong and try to help us to correct them. The main purpose of the dream of this nature is directive. The vision is a directive, purposeful uh, appearance which comes to us out of the directive and purposeful parts of our own subjective. It is therefore a dream of authority. It is a dream which expresses the will of the superior nature of ourselves. And as this superior nature is more aware of truth or more aware of reality than we are, it is customary to consider that such dreams as this are also indicative of the will of God or the will of truth, 
or the manifestation of those laws which must be kept, those principles which cannot be violated. The archetypal dream, then, is a dream of realities, and it is usually accompanied by certain symptoms or certain conditions by which we are able to differentiate it from other dreams. Archetypal dreams are often described by the person who has them as waking experiences. The person is loath to believe that he is asleep. He is inclined to feel that he awakened before this vision appeared. And I have talked to a great many persons who have had this type of experience during sleeping hours or when, it, normally speaking, it would be assumed that they were asleep, and yet they insist that they were awake when the experience happened. You may go a little further with them in this questioning, however. You may ask them, well, if you were awake, what did you do? Being awake, what would you, what would you do? Did you jump out of bed? Did you sit up? Did you uh, reach for a pencil and paper to record this experience? Uh, what did you say yourself? How did you think? What did you feel? Answers to these questions are always dim and evasive. One individual will say, well, I didn't move, I couldn't move, because the experience itself seemed to paralyze me. I was conscious, but I could not move. Another one will say, well, my eyes were open, I could see, I know I could see, because I closed my eyes, and when I closed my eyes, the vision wasn't there. Therefore, it had to have been something that had a solidity outside of myself. But at the moment of the experience, I did not feel like doing anything. I fell in a strange state of suspension. I knew I was awake, but I did not move, I did not want to move, I could not speak. All of the normal functions were suspended. An occasion, of course, once in a great while, you will have a dream of this kind or a vision in which some other person is in the room at the time. This is not so common, but it does happen. And I know in one case that a person who explained the vision uh, and told of having apparently reacted quite physically and to have been wide awake and the other person testified definitely that the person was completely asleep through the entire process. Yet the person having the vision could not believe that he was asleep. Thus the vision differs from the dream in this peculiar validity of the sense of waking or the sense of conscious awareness. It does not have the same mysterious sense of merely being part of a shadow. It is not something through which you pass as a distinct experience as merely a being moving through some strange region like the mysterious realms of Dante and Milton. And the vision experience is one in which something happens to you. You know about it. You sense it. It is meaningful. Often also the vision or circumstance of this nature is preceded by some rather mysterious situation. It is frequently preceded by a sense of extreme coldness or chill. And those who have recorded visions other than at night, who apparently have been uh, picked up into a vision state while sitting at a table or while reading a book or something of this nature, nearly always report the sense of chill. They report as a, a change in the atmosphere around them. What they are really telling us, of course, is a change in the circulation of their own bodies. The circulation seems to retire from the periphery and to center around certain vital areas of consciousness. This is something that is common to man in danger of shock. And very often, a person subjected to a sudden danger has the sense of chill. Also, a certain types of illness produce this feeling, which is generally regarded as a poor symptom. 
Actually, however, this sense of chill seems to be one way in which the individual tries to express or explain something which happens in sleep, but of which he is not aware when in the normal sleeping state, namely the tendency of the temperature of the body to lower. Most of those who have had visions, uh, for instance, as we said, at tables or, or uh, sitting uh, outdoors under a tree watching the scenery or something of that nature, most persons reporting such visions also describe a certain sense of haziness, the approach of something resembling sleep. They are nodding, they are not fully objectively aware, they are not uh, usually engaged in any active enterprise at that moment. They are resting, taking it easy, contemplating, or absorbed in some thought or study. In these moments, this mysterious pattern takes hold, and we find the individual suddenly receiving a tremendous impulse from within his own consciousness. Now, we all know, of course, the things seen around us in the physical world do not enter the brain and are not recorded as things seen. The material objective environment in which we live is carried into the brain in the form of impulses. We, we do not carry a picture of the chair of this microphone into the brain, although we appear to see it there. The eye picks up a certain image, transforms it into vibratory waves, and transfers these waves to the brain where they reassemble in the form of the object. This means that the form creating process is also in the brain, and that vibrations striking the brain are or can be transformed into images by the processes of the brain uh, itself. This means that an image projected from the interior part of man's psychic life and impressed upon the brain can take form there, can take image and likeness there, and can appear to be just as real and certain as any physical thing which the individual can see. A proof of this process is, of course, hypnosis. For in hypnosis, an imaginary person or a person suggested into existence by the hypnotist may be placed among a group of real persons. And the individual seeing the real persons will at the same time see a person existing only in his own mind. That person will fit completely into the scenery and landscape, will be just as natural in appearance as the others. There will be no way in which the person under hypnotic pressure can determine the difference between a real person and this other person. And if this other person is mingled with a dozen real persons, this person can walk among them, or appear to pass behind one or in front of another, and the human mental equipment will rationalize the entire situation so completely that the hypnotized person will be unable to determine which of those people in front of him is a re physical reality and which one is an imagined being. In the same way, the hypnotist can block out one person from a group so that of twelve persons, eleven will be visible and the twelfth invisible. And this invisible person will be in the room with all the others, talking with them, conversing with them, walking among them, and be totally invisible because the entire situation is controlled from the brain itself and not by the sensory perceptions as we know them. Thus, in a dream or in a vision, forms are engendered in the brain as the result of vibratory mental image patterns. Now, we may ask what these image patterns might be that would cause this kind of a formation within the consciousness of the person. There are as yet no absolutely conclusive processes formularized. But the process seems to be this. All thought 
whether it arises from observation or whether it arises from internal processes. All thought is vibration. Thoughts have within themselves their own vibratory patterns and images. A thought or an impression pressed upon the mind and transferred from the mind to the brain must there clothe itself in the available materials from which the brain can derive its images. The brain cannot derive its images from any material which is not within its range of perception and reflection. In other words, if the brain of man is going to interpret any symbol or energy or to give form to any abstract idea, it must clothe that abstraction in something which the brain itself has objectively experienced. It is perfectly possible, therefore, for the brain to bestow any form with which it is familiar, but no form with which it is not familiar. The most abstract form that the brain apparently is capable of bestowing is simply light. The most abstract negation is darkness. Therefore, things otherwise beyond formation, beyond any experience by which form can be implied, have the tendency to appear as light, have the, have the tendency to appear also as simple geometrical patterns arising in light or composed of light. These geometrical patterns are derived from basic psychic archetypes, but they must also exist in this world in order for the brain to be able to register them. At a very primitive time in man's experience, his own mental processes apparently, attempted to create a differentiating procedure by means of which things natural could in some way be mentally separated from things supernatural. The brain unable to experience a supernatural thing or to give form to a thing formless as far as faculties and perceptions are concerned, hit upon a strategy which has since been distributed throughout society. And that was the strategy of creating extraordinary forms out of compounds of ordinary ones. A man walking along the street is a natural form. A horse galloping down the road is a natural form. Yet how shall we suddenly create out of this situation the instrument of an unnatural form? a form by which we could appear to convey something that is not of this world. Well, if we take the upper part of the man and put it onto the lower part of the horse, we have a centaur. A centaur does not exist to our experience, yet it is composed of two creatures that do exist. Thus we have the symbol of something unworldly, something metaphysical, something transcendental, something out of this world, by the simple contrivance of combining two natural forms into what the mind recognizes as an impossible combination. This is a very common symbolic process, and may have resulted in many of the ancient symbols which have descended to us from antiquity. Among the Chinese, the dragon was such a form. Among various peoples, satyrs and various nymphs and mermaids and other such creatures were these unnatural forms. They were forms by means of which the consciousness could convey the sense of unworldliness. This is still used in the medicine rituals of primitive peoples, in the mask cult, where the individual becomes superhuman by wearing a mask which completely conceals his natural features and conveys the impression of a monstrous or unnatural being. The brain, therefore, seems to hit upon this contrivance. Perhaps if it could not or did not, we would never have developed these cults among men. But they are, do exist and are in very common knowledge throughout the world. They represent unworldliness produced by distortion, 
Michelangelo recognized this in art, and we know that his great figure of Moses gains its tremendous authority by its deformity. For if this figure stood up, it would be in completely disproportion. But this we do not recognize, rather receiving a certain impact of unworldliness. The distortion has not been carried to the degree of the grotesque. It has simply broken our common acceptances of what constituted humanity, what constituted ordinary things. Oriental artists achieve the same effect when representing deities as of great size and human beings associated with them as small figures beside them. Here the, giant, the giganticness creates the unworldliness. So in the subconscious vision dream sequences, as for instance in the Apocalypse, we have the introduction of a number of mysterious composite creatures becoming symbols of ideas, means by which the brain, in receiving impulses, is able to combine abstractions and make them available to us through symbolic forms. The interpretation of these symbols and the mysterious meanings which they have remind us, of course, of the mysterious interpretation of the great figure in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Here the king dreamt of this extraordinary figure with head of gold and feet of clay and of the stone which was cast against its feet and the image collapsed. And all of the soothsayers and interpreters of dreams and visions were invited to come and explain this strange dream. And finally the prophet did so and gained great distinction in the land. But these kinds of dreams, these kinds of experiences, appear to be archetypal inasmuch as they represent a meaning pressing from within clothing itself in forms different from those of nature, yet near enough to nature for man to grasp their significance. Now, it is another peculiarity of this type of vision that the meaning or the explanation is frequently communicated with the form. Part of the processes of interpretation are carried on subconsciously even before the person having the vision is aware of the process. Others become apparent to us from objective contemplation, the process of applying the symbolism to known incidents in our own living gradually reveals the meaning. In any event, your archetypal dream, making use of innumerable subconscious contrivance, it takes form in the brain, takes form within the consciousness of the individual, and is projected from there in one way or another. Sometimes the projection is rather abstract and in itself mysterious. Many visions, the individual rather feels himself projected into the vision. He feels as Ezekiel did, that he suddenly is in the midst of the world of his own dream. Yet this is no common dream. This is no dream involving just ordinary personal problems. It is a cosmic dream. A dream of a universe made up of wheels within wheels. A dream of the Merkava or the chariot of righteousness, born upon the powers and wings of the cherubim, in which sits the master of the mysteries. All these visions indicate archetypal insight. They represent some psychic truth, some message trying to break through into objectivity, some manner of communicating the abstract to faculties which are unable to receive the pressure of the direct abstract. The brain taking hold, for instance, of a form must be able to associate this form with, an, uh, with a pattern or symbol. This was one of the great difficulties recorded in the development of primitive writing. Ancient peoples were able very early to develop symbols representing objects. They were able, for example, to tie symbols to certain gentle processes of man. The Egyptians, for example, when they wished to indicate walking, made pictures of feet. This seemed to be quite consistent. 
And, of course, in the early days, they made it even simpler by indicating the direction of the journey by the direction of the feet. It seemed to be very, very necessary. Our friends down in Central America during their ancient uh, period of developing written language went further than feet. They made little footsteps as though in sand drawn upon their manuscripts. And these footsteps led from the symbol of one town to the symbol of another town and indicated that a journey had been made from one place to another. Uh, this was not impossible. They also had excellent manners of incorporating known forms in symbolism. The Chinese had the same method. The Egyptians, when they wished to describe a cat, drew a picture of it. When they wanted to think, uh, discuss a vulture, they drew a picture of it. Uh, the ancient peoples of other lands did the same thing. The Chinese ideoglyph for a horse has four long strokes at the bottom indicating legs and was originally a picture of the horse. In the course of time, and perhaps uh, with the decay of artistry, uh, it was no longer entirely convenient to draw a full horse every time you wanted to write about one. So gradually the glyph was simplified. But in the beginning, all of these forms were derived from nature. Then your ancient writer ran against his big problem. How was he to make pictures of things that were not visible? How could he make pictures of ideas? How could he draw a picture of virtue? Virtue didn't look like a cat or a dog. Virtue didn't have a nice, neat shape like a building or a house, nor did it shine like a star which could be represented by rays. Virtue was a quality. Honesty was a quality. Death was more than a quality, because you could indicate death by having a, a living thing lying down, indicating that it had ceased to live. But you couldn't just do that with virtue. Also, you had uh, very grave trouble with verb forms, action of various kinds. Ordinary action, you could understand. But if this action involved a very complicated procedure of some kind, the ingenuity of the artist and the ability of the beholder to correctly translate the art, both were stretched beyond a reasonable degree. There was very little way in which these abstractions could be represented. Therefore, gradually, man had to develop abstract forms to represent abstract powers. These forms could not simply be shown to someone he had to receive the key to their meaning. Thus, gradually, a whole group of symbols appeared which had to be learned or remembered. And with that, the public school system came into its primordial existence, probably in the form of the old man of the tribe, instructing the young ones in the meaning of these forms that were not obvious. So all invisible beings, creatures, principles, energies, and powers came to be included among the unobvious form. And the greatest surviving unobvious form of all in nature is the form of God. And among most primitive people, there was no symbol for the supreme deity, because man could not even conceive an appropriate symbol. Finally, the idea of no symbol suggested a crystallization or concretion of no symbol by simply taking an area and inscribing it or uh, circumscribing it with a circle. The circle, therefore, became the symbol of infinity because it was an area in which there was nothing. The same thing was the principle behind the use of certain jade implements in China, where the flat disk with the opening in the center became the symbol of deity. The opening or hollow or empty place being the only possible symbol of God. So in this process of primitive man learning how to transmit ideas, we have perhaps the same the mystery of vocabulary that we have in the human being's inner consciousness trying to press moral abstractions upon the objective mind. One way, of course, is feeling. But here again, although feeling 
is an older sensory perception than sight, it is less specific. And in the effort to impress by feeling, uh, it was necessary to in some way excite emotion. And this ex exciting of emotion again required some form of emotional symbolism. We find this in a good deal of mysticism, but it has never proven universally satisfactory. The individual feels certain compulsions and may follow them. Uh, but again, the vibration has been transformed uh, from impulse uh, to a specialized area of activities where this impulse is interpreted in terms of personal emotions. The point that I want to make uh, primarily is that just as surely as outside symbols and thoughts enter into the brain through the perception, they are reintegrated into patterns. These patterns, in turn, subjected to further rationalization, leading to co comprehension. So that comprehension and recognition and acceptance is, the, is due largely to a series of related impulses, combining to form one basic concept. And it's just the same type of thing as Immanuel Kant gives us in his example of how we know that an apple is an apple. Uh, we certainly must know this by the use of many faculties and powers carrying their common report to a center in the brain where the puzzle is solved instantly and all the parts are fitted together. And if a major part is not present, then we are not certain that it is an apple. If some major necessary element does not contribute to the final project, our certainty is not adequate or not uh, true. We must then go back, look again, touch again, smell again, taste again, to make sure that it is an apple. All of this process is in one direction, from the outer world into the core of man. The opposite motion is from a superior state above and beyond man, downward into the core of man. It is as though man's psychic nature was like the middle place in an hourglass. Energies moving from above enter the brain and have their impressions. Images moving from below enter the brain and have their impressions. And in the so-called vision situation, the energy from the superior part of consciousness moves in and imposes itself upon the brain processes, resulting in a number of possible explanations or manifestations. We may have what might be termed the auditory experience, in which we see nothing but hear something. This simply means that the brain itself has integrated vibration into sound. And we are hearing something inside of ourselves, although it may appear to be coming to us from the outside. In this matter, of course, our common attitudes play a part. To our general thinking, sound must come from the outside, for noise is of the outside. It therefore is inconsistent with our common experience to assume that sound would come from an invisible silence within us. It must, rather, come from the world of sound around us. And the inner sounds mingling with the outer sounds, we are unable to distinguish the source of one from the source of the other. Thus, we frequently assume that we hear things said around us that are really from within us. The projection of images may also be attributed to the same process. An individual looking at a wall under certain conditions may see an image appear upon that wall, very much as in the old days of a stereoptican slide. This image upon the wall may be animate, move, and perform various actions, and even speak. But it is a projection within ourselves. The image seen on the wall is inside of us. The wall, however, is on the outside, 
And the combining of the wall and the interior image is like uniting two negatives in the production of a photograph in which two pictures are blended to form one picture. This double process of the picture, in this case, however, means that the picture arises in two different parts of consciousness and the union takes place within the ordering faculties of the brain. Naturally, the brain itself, uh, which is probably ordering this procedure without self-knowledge of its own ordering, being an instrument rather than a being, the brain is not aware of its own uh, inability to discriminate between the interior and the exterior picture. So the whole consciousness of man is inclined to project the situation onto the outside where it is familiar, where there is the least resistance, and where the greatest expectancies are likely to lurk. That brings us to this other question that we find occasionally in cases of vision, in which the vision apparently must be on the outside because we can open and close our eyes. If we open our eyes and the vision is there, we close our eyes and the vision is not there, then the vision must be on the outside. This again is not true as mental experimentation has shown. Remember that the moment we test an inner experience by means of some function of our own, we are undoubtedly and inevitably determined to achieve certain results. We have certain expectancies, and these expectancies are autonomic within ourselves. The average person expects something seen to disappear when he closes his eyes. And because this expectancy exists in the subtle substance of mental material, the expectancy is immediately fulfilled. Also, the voluntary action of opening and closing the eyes may be enough in itself to temporarily disturb the image. But the real and common answer to this is that the individual being the internal controller of the whole process, is able to create any verisimilitude which he wishes. If he insists that the image shall remain when his eyes are closed, it will remain. If he knows that it cannot remain, it will not remain. The mind is a magician in these things and will accomplish whatever we demand of it. And we know under hypnosis that this accomplishment or well, this acceptance of determination is instantaneous. Therefore, that it is useless to assume that we would have to argue ourselves into one concept or the other. That which we naturally accept immediately and inevitably occurs. Actually, we have uh, almost complete evidence, not that a vision is false, but that a vision is communicated to man only because man is man and in a way possible to man. We have never yet had true historical evidence of the intercession of deity in the affairs of men, except through men. We do not find someone meeting God on the street and asking him for something. We do not have the experience of the man who prays for financial help, having a hand reached down from heaven with a pocketbook in it. Man himself expects this help to occur or arise mysteriously, but he knows that this mystery will be associated with beings of his own kind, that where he needs help, help will come to him in a natural way. It is only the faith that it will occur and the conviction that the means will be provided in some, new, in some supernatural way that adds mystery to the simple circumstance. Man is convinced, therefore, in all of his works and ways, that the God he seeks help from will give this help through its creatures and not in proper persons. That if the farmer prays for rain, it may rain. But the rain will be coming from clouds, not from a blue sky that these clouds will gather in some way and according to their own laws and then precipitate. It may be that man is able to create artificial rain in some cases, 
but then he must reproduce natural processes in order to attain this end. So man has long learned that the great visions, the great mysteries, the great revelations that come to humanity come through highly sensitive persons who are regarded as prophets, messiahs, avatars, world teachers, seers, sages, and mystics. The vision comes to the sensitive person and is from him communicated to others who lack the sensitivity to have the experience themselves. Also, in some instances, experiences appear to occur to more than one person. This has long been a very difficult situation, but psychology is beginning to pick up the threads of it. It now realizes that what is termed the archetypal form, or the archetypal dream, arises as Plato's archetypes are known to have arisen uh, from a pattern that exists in space. Under certain common problem or common stress or tension, this pattern may impinge itself upon more than one person at a time. There are instances apparently in which it has impinged itself upon a multitude of persons at one time each one seeing the same thing, but each one of them seeing from within himself the agreement within the archetype. And the archetype imperiled upon the consciousness of the individual was sufficiently firm to produce a generally common experience. But each person saw within himself that which others saw likewise. But as each also beheld the occurrence as though outside of himself, we have the phenomenon of the multitude seeing at once. I know one case in which there was a very good report of this, in which several hundred persons saw the same thing at the same time. But these several hundred persons were among probably a hundred thousand persons, the rest not seeing it at all. Now, had the event been completely a physical, optical experience, all persons, except perhaps a very small group, highly defective in their optical equipment, would have seen it. But where seven men standing along the side of a ship all see a phantom ship, but seven more men standing alongside of them see nothing, we must assume rather that an archetype of some kind has impressed those seven men. It is the only way in which we can uh, seriously seek to solve the problem. For if the ship had actually been there and had been equally visible to all persons with equal optical equipment, they would all have seen it. Thus the vision as archetype may impinge itself upon more than one person. And there is indication, as in what are called the apocalyptical visions, that an archetype in nature gradually develops or unfolds to a degree of almost completeness, so that this archetype has a highly involved symbolism of its own. But the archetypal symbols are set within the function of a universal mind, operating similar to man's mind, but also in the process of transforming abstractions into orderly symbolic patterns. Under certain problems or processes, these collective archetypes can be impressed upon a number of minds simultaneously, and minds of a certain degree of sensitivity or receptivity will receive them whereas other minds will not. We know this is true in practically every field of human activity, that what we term uh, the, uh, the law of exception depends upon the fact that even the most common circumstance cannot always be depended upon to occur to all persons. A certain remedy against an ailment may cure 90 cases and leave 10 untouched 
or a new drug may help 50 people, injure 20, and have no effect upon 30. The reasons for these differences lie within the person and not within the drug. The drug is an inanimate, impersonal thing, but it has to operate upon animate, personalized creatures, and their reactions depend upon themselves. A powerful impulse arising in the universal mind, an archetype or folk image, is itself impressed upon various persons. Some record it, some do not, some distort it. To some it is a great and wonderful experience, to others a terrible and dangerous experience, all depending upon the integration of the being upon whose abstract mental structure the impression is made. Generally speaking, then, I think we can say that the vision, generally and uh, universal, is nature's method of conveying some form of knowledge, some form of knowing uh, beyond the normal capacity of the individual to comprehend. To do this, several factors are introduced. One is shock or stress, by which the entire experience is made important as being unusual, unique, or totally different. The second important factor is that it occurs and appears to occur to this person himself. It is not reported, it is not communicated, it is not conveyed. It is something which the person can afterwards feel that he has known because it has happened to him. The next situation is that it must interpret itself in some material available for such interpretation. Where the materials are available, they will be used. Where they are not available, of materials relatively available will be grouped together in a new pattern or design in order that they may be the vehicle for an extraordinary idea. This very grouping, visualized by the individual within himself, becomes extremely important because it is strange or different, challenges his imagination and his thought, and invites him to the definite consideration of the experience as being valid or different, or important in itself. We know, for example, that in many parts of the world uh, where Christianity has sent its missionaries, uh, peoples coming under the influence of the Christian faith have mystical experiences. They have them in other religions also. But the point of interest is that nearly always where a person of one of these other groups has a vision relating to Christianity, this vision is always invested in the forms natural to that person. Uh, mystics of China, for instance, who have had visions of Jesus, have drawn pictures of their visions, and in their visions, Jesus was always Chinese. He had to be, because he was drawn out of the subconscious repository of their own instincts. They had to clothe him in the forms that they knew and understood. They could not hope to understand or comprehend him as a blonde Anglo-Saxon. They had no knowledge or acquaintance with such people. If, however, these Chinese later became acquainted with a number of Anglo-Saxons and saw numerous pictures of Jesus until the subconscious was sufficiently impressed with this symbolism, then the mystical experience might well present him in his basically Anglo-Saxon or Teuton appearance, which probably also is entirely remote from his actual appearance. Because again, it is our archetype, our own racial and national concept, which has become the basis of most of our religious art. So in thinking through from sacred things outward, we always close them in the familiar. The vision, therefore, does create these forms in order to communicate, in order to impress itself upon us. Now, visions, of course, are not all valid. I am referring to those that are essentially valid. 
not to those which are simply the products of imagination or of the particular stress of the psyche as the result of disturbances of the outer life. Assuming, however, that the true vision occurs when man is receptive and is quiet, has entered the stillness and is seeking to know the truth, or in those hours when this stillness is imposed upon him by nature, and therefore most suitable for the further imposition of a spiritual factor, where the vision is genuine, it nearly always has this sense of authenticity in it. It is meaningful, it is reasonable, it is proper. It is solutional. It carries with it a mark of validity, as though it was sealed by the very seal of God. Under such conditions, the individual is not even inclined to resist it. He is not inclined to doubt it. Its peculiar clarity and integrity come through to him. This may also be true of certain imaginary experiences, but less often. And one of the great keys that has been used down through the ages in determining the validity of vision is the consequence. That type of vision which changes the life of the person for the better, which takes the individual as it took St. Francis of Assisi, out of a life of dissipation and intemperance and sanctified him to the best that he knew in the way of the service of the need of his fellow men. That kind of vision which brings great understanding, philosophic insight, or advances man's knowledge of things factual. That type of inner experience of auditory type which has been given to the great musician and composer by which he has been able to bring through into objectivity melodies and marvelous harmonies which he has first heard as mystical happenings within his own consciousness. All of these things relate to the availability within man of a superior power capable of being released at need or under certain circumstances for the preservation or the improvement of his life or the service of his world. Where visions have led to great improvement, there is very little to be gained by doubting them. If, however, they do not lead to improvement, if they merely lead to fanaticism or mania, then we have no real need, under the study of psychology, to use this circumstance or such instances as a disproof of vision. It merely proves to us that these experiences can arise either from the lower psychic nature or the higher. And where they arise from the lower nature, regardless of the picturesqueness which they present, they tell the story of our sickness or our trouble. But where they arise from the deeper nature of man, they tell the story of his hope, of his aspiration, of his inner resource, of the spiritual destiny which is, in, which is his in life, and the call to uh, the recognition of higher levels of being, of purpose, of achievement, of realization than he has formerly known. Under these conditions, the vision becomes a vital experience, whether it occurs during sleeping or waking hours. But from its machinery, we can understand how nature very often involves it in the sleep mystery. Well, I think our time is up for this time, so we'll have to leave it till next week.